Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse Silver. I'm the practice director for the security and compliance team here at Red Level. And today I thought we would do a, a, an additional session. This is our first session here of our Cyber Aware month, uh, and there's one of four. So we've got three more excellent sessions coming up. And yeah, let's just dive in because I've got a lot to cover. So I just want to show you really quick that, you know, today we're going to be talking about an arts and entertainment industry case study. This is a real life study. And uh, today, as opposed to the Modern Workplace Summit, uh, we'll go a little bit more in depth and I'll even show you a live demo um, of some of the things that we look at and, and kind of how we detect these, these sort of attacks and what you can do in your environment to, to look at this stuff. So that's today. October 5th um, and you know just that we've got a couple other not a couple three precisely more coming 12th 19th 26th uh, those are going to be great so definitely don't want to miss those as well so uh, coming in for those so we'll see you next week um, after this one Great, so just a really quick about me uh, if you came to the modern workplace summer I added a little bit to the slide um, but yeah, again, I'm the director here of the security and compliance practice at Red Level. Um, 14 years plus in the IT industry. I started out as a consultant in San Francisco 2007 and supporting private equity, hedge fund, law firms, stuff like that in the financial district. And uh, yeah, made, you know, I've been in-house, I've been a consultant, I've been an engineer, I've, you know, I've, I've done system admin, I've done it all. Um, and yeah, I spent the last five years as a Microsoft Cloud consultant specifically. Uh, that's really been my passion lately and just how it's accelerated my career and it's just such a big, exciting, growing industry. And here we are, right? And and really excited about that. So again, uh, I've, I've supported every industry that you can imagine, uh, you know, from adult entertainment uh, like shops that, you know, that's one of our clients um, to tribal nations. I've done a lot of work uh, with government, state and local government, uh, DOD defense contractors, mom and pop shops. Again, a lot of financial sector industry work. So I'm, I'm pretty up on compliance and regulatory stuff and not just security. So the compliance side. Uh, again, my focus is identity and access management, information protection, which is going to be huge in the next coming years um, and cloud app security, which is my favorite thing ever. And we'll we'll do a demonstration of that soon enough. So yeah, worked in Office M365 for eight plus years. And I just thought for fun, I would show you uh, a couple of photos. These photos, all three of those photos there on the slide were taken day before yesterday. So these aren't just generic things I picked, but I was up in the mountains and we had a moose encounter that was really intense. And I caught some rainbow trout and the beautiful fall colors up in the Rocky Mountains here. I'm in Colorado, so I just thought I'd show you that I'm a real person that likes to do real stuff on the side. Um, but anyway, just thought those would be fun pictures. And again, that was those were all taken day before yesterday. Um, great. So let's dive in to this specific use case. And again, I'm going to kind of go through the deck. I'm going to do a little bit of a live demonstration um, and uh, of just kind of where uh, within your environment you can kind of take a look at this stuff. So that not just not just slides, but actual real world demo. Um, and then if there's any questions here at the end, we can open up as needed. Great. So again, this case study is really what I want to focus on is breach prevention, right? Is as I covered in the Modern Workplace Summit, one of the core tenets of the zero trust architecture is assume breach, right? And that's you are going to have infiltrations of certain echelons or layers of your security that you are just going to have to assume are going to be breached right and with assume breach it, it means that someone may already be in your network right it's not just that it's going to happen it's that someone may already be in which is a, a scary but great security approach so with assume breach we have defense in depth right we leverage a defense in depth strategy for security and compliance that really covers all of the zero trust pillars. Again, identity, devices, applications, data, network, infrastructure. Now there's a, another 
Zero Trust Pillar on top of all those that I talked about before that's called VAO or Visibility Automation Orchestration. It's not a separate pillar, it's more just maturing and operationalizing all of those individual pillars. How do you have visibility into everything? How do you have visibility into multiple things at once? How do you automate and orchestrate your processes? And that doesn't just mean, oh, I have a threat response automation. That means onboarding, right? A new user starts. You have a, an automation workflow that kicks in that gives them permissions and accounts and security policies and devices and all that. Um, so we really think about getting our high maturity in security and compliance, but that also, again, goes out to operations and management, right? Uh, why not save time and energy and money and manpower? Um, and, you know, be more secure and compliant at the same time. That's the automation and orchestration piece. And I'll show you uh, kind of what some automation means here in a few minutes in the live demo. So back to the case study. This is one of my favorite clients. Uh, they're just an awesome organization and they have about 250 information and frontline workers, as a lot of you do. Uh, information workers, again, it's just people, button seat in an office, finance, HR, you know, whatever, they have a cubicle, they have a dedicated computer, uh, probably, right? Maybe even a traveling sales person, you could call them, you know, those are kind of a, a, a gray area between frontline and information workers, but they're your core office workers. And then frontline workers, they may not have a computer. They may just have an email account and log into a kiosk, or they may just have email and Teams and use uh, a BYOD, bring your own device policy on a personal phone. Right, so they may just connect to those apps on a personal device. They may be handed a tablet on their shift. They may be a warehouse worker that you know comes and and you know fills out their time cards and checks their email on a on a shared computer or an office computer, whatever. So those are our frontline workers. And as we're finding, um, you know, this is critically important to think about them and your security perimeters because a lot of the traditional IT security work infrastructure uh, was around information workers, finance, HR, legal, you know, IT, whatever, executive. But so many organizations have frontline workers. It's so essential that they have access to the systems, programs, processes that they need, but you worry about their security as much or even more because they're on the front lines. And let's be real, they're usually the least trained, right? They don't do the phishing training or whatever. They're just, you know, they're the warehouse person. They're, they're stacking crates or they're, you know, guiding tours in a museum or their security, right? They're not, they're not sitting in front of a computer all day kind of living this IT world. So anyway, this is, this is for them and you'll see why in a minute. So again, let's review what happened, how it happened and what prevented a larger breach. So, what happened? Uh, frontline worker accounts, multiple, mind you, were targeted for an attack. How this happened? This was a sophisticated phishing campaign. This wasn't just one of those, oh, dear sir, or madam, you know, like poorly spelled things that you may see if, if you are still using Hotmail um, <laughs> or Yahoo, right? If you have Gmail, you probably don't get too many of those these days because they actually have very good filtering. But if you're using one of the crappier services like Hotmail or, or especially Yahoo or you know, MSN, stuff like that, Comcast.net, emails, you'll be getting these emails, right? Um, but this was a sophisticated phishing campaign. These looked very good. They had urgency. They had action, right? Which is just hallmark of, of phishing emails. And well, what happened was that these frontline workers said, oh, I guess I need to reset my password, right? And they followed the link. They went out and they thought they were resetting their password or they thought they were accessing a document. Well, that's because it was a fake M365 login site. Now, they should have known because this client has done our security work and we have a custom login page. So they should know that, hey, this isn't our custom login page with my museum logo and beautiful picture on it. This is just a generic one. A lot of you are probably still using the generic login page. A lot of you maybe didn't even know that you could use a custom login page and logo. That's absolutely something to think about doing because for obvious reasons, right? Because if I'm going to a custom login page, I know that that's my login site. If I'm going to a generic one, I may know something's up. So 
really at this point, their passwords were owned, right? This malicious group, attacker, what have you, they got access to these passwords. Now, what happened next may surprise you. <laughs> they didn't get in, right? And that's because conditional access policies activated and the malicious access was blocked. That's our defense and depth strategy. And I'll go through that here in a minute and kind of show you in a, in a live demo, starting to look at that. So really not, uh, you know, and I'm gonna kind of go into detail about that here in a minute, but I wanted to say also what happened after that, right? Is that the risk signals were logged, right? We got alerts that there was some, some risky accounts because the first login attempt by the malicious actor, that worked. They had the username, they had the password. These frontline workers gave up their passwords, right? So conditional access only kicks in at the second authentication, right? The second layer of authentication, and then from there. So we log these as risk users. Hey, why is this user randomly logging in from another country or another state, you know, while they just logged in from the United States, this a certain state a few minutes ago, right? So we log those risk signals. We updated our phishing policies because these emails shouldn't have made it through, to be honest. So that's that's also a perimeter defense defense and depth strategy that's really important for you guys to remember that you you are constantly tuning things, right? A lot of our identity and access management policies, those are, I don't wanna say set them and forget them, those are really automated, right? So that we don't have to go in and adjust. They just kick in, they kick in, you know, if one fails, the next one picks up, right? That's the important thing to remember. But for things like phishing and spoofing, that's really tough. Those are an ongoing evolving threat. Your spam, malware, phishing, and spoofing filtering that worked last week may not work as well this week because it's a constantly evolving threat. Now, Microsoft, Proofpoint, all these major companies, they're constantly tuning these systems and policies, right? So a lot of that's happening on the back end. Oh, this is a new campaign that we're seeing. Let's adjust, right? But some of that's going to be on you. Right? Some of that will be on you to go into your anti-phishing, anti-spoofing, spoof intelligence policies and maybe adjust something, maybe add a rule, maybe add an exemption, maybe go into your quarantine, maybe go into your message trace, which is what we did here, and say, look, you should have caught this, Microsoft, right? This was, this was, a, this, this was a spoof, this was a phish, right? So that's a constant adjustment. And then most importantly, the last thing that is what happened is that we educated the users. As I said in the Modern Workplace Summit, educating your users is such a big part of security now. You can't just rely on policies and automation and security. You have to tell people, put on your tinfoil hats. Let's get paranoid together, right? Because if they're not paranoid, if they're not thinking, wait a second, I don't normally get a password reset email. Wait a second. I don't normally get a OneDrive share request email like this that looks like this. Why am I getting this, right? So if you're not diligently training your users, educating them and keeping them paranoid, you are not doing your job as IT or leadership, executive leadership, right? It's incumbent on you to empower your users and train them how to detect phishing attempts, how to detect spoofing, what spoofing is, what social engineering is, right? How all of that stuff works because your users are your front line. These front line workers gave up their passwords. They should not, they should have recognized this as a phishing campaign in the first place and never given up their passwords. We stopped the attack because we have defense in depth, but your first line of that defense in depth is your users and their education and paranoia. As I always tell my users when I was in-house, as we give these trainings to users when we do these projects, if you are even 2% suspicious of something, that's enough, right? If something seems a little off, wait, why would I have a password reset? That font looks weird from last time. Oh, that email address looks kind of funny. Wait, why would my CEO be asking me to get iTunes gift cards, right? If you just have to stop for a second and ask why, or raise an eyebrow, a 2% suspicion, that's enough to, to stop and take action on it besides doing what the thing asks, right? Buy me gift cards, reset your password, open this OneDrive doc, whatever. Don't do that, stop and think, be paranoid. So we, we train our users 
uh, and red level, right? We, we, we do our own IT, we have internal users. We, not everyone is technologists, right? So we train our own users to be paranoid and they're, and I love it. They're paranoid, it works well. It's a great line of defense. So really compromised passwords is the, the lesson here is you can't stop 100% of phishing emails. It's a constantly evolving threat. Remember that, right? I want you to remember that you cannot say nothing will get through. If you tighten up your filters too much, you're gonna have false positives. You're gonna have legitimate emails going into quarantine. On the other hand, if you loosen it up too much, you're gonna have false negatives. You're gonna have phishing and spoofing campaigns going to your inboxes, maybe your spam if you're lucky. So that's a constantly evolving battle and changing threat, and you can't stop 100% of attacks. And even though we're gonna train our users and they're paranoid, uh, and I love that, that training only goes so far. There's also attacks where maybe a CEO's account could get compromised or a very good spoof or fish could happen because your DMARC, DKIM, SPF is not configured properly. And this user legitimately thinks it's the CEO. As I went over, and I'll go over uh, uh, later this month in, a, in a, one of these other case studies is we had a very amazing, sophisticated social engineering campaign happen to one of our um, clients, right? Who didn't want to engage with us with security earlier this year. And it was a whole fake conversation with the CEO and a vendor. It wasn't fake because these accounts, the vendors and the CEOs were really compromised. There was no, there was no digital spoofing. There was real spoofing, right? They got, they took the actual account. They weren't just pretending to be the person's account. They're pretending to be the person in the real account. So there's some complexity of attacks that you can't possibly mitigate, right? So user training only goes so far. There's some really good ones out there, some really smart social engineering ones where they know your name, they know about you, they know who you talk to, they know how your boss normally emails you, right? So there's some really good stuff out there happening. User training only goes so far. So what do we use? We use conditional access. That's an IAM, Identity and Access Management Strategy. What happened for this specific use case, case study? International access, the first, the, that, that first authentication attempt happened from an international country, blocked. Second of all, it was a legacy authentication protocol. We don't do those anymore. Those are bad. If you're doing legacy auth in your tenant, stop. Now, uh, this is you know, what we do for our engagements these days, one of the first prerequisites, right? So we enforce modern authentication. Then as another backup layer, we have MFA enforcement, right? Modern authentication. These users are like, wait, I didn't, I didn't do a modern auth prompt. So they denied it, they stopped the attack. Right, it would have been stopped from these other layers, but we have defense in depth. So that's our strategy. Now we go further, right? We go a lot further and we say, that's our defense in depth strategy. The attack was stopped. Now, again, adjustments in education, we may finally tune those phishing and spoofing policies. It's a constant battle. But another thing is we, we progress to the next layer. We level up. That's what we're all about at red level. And we go to device trust. We get our devices hybrid Azure already joined, Intune enrolled. <clears throat> we go far beyond that. We do Windows Update for Business, security baselines, attack surface reduction, BitLocker drive encryption. We do a ton in Intune. And then we say, hey, conditional access. You can't even access these resources unless you're on one of our trusted devices. Our trusted device goes a long way. Those are locked down secure devices. Maybe we'll let you access via the browser, but no desktop apps. MFA every time, only the United States, you get the idea, right? Um, we, we have defense in depth. So I can't really go too far into that. I, I don't wanna give away our secrets. I want you to come uh, work with us and let me uh, do these projects for you. They're not secrets, it's in Microsoft Docs, all of this stuff. Um, but this is what we do all day, every day. It's our bread and butter, right? It's defense in depth. We do baseline identity project, we do baseline device project, we do de device solidification, and then we do device trust. The last thing I'll say here is you do not wanna do location trust anymore. If you were trusting a corporate network, that is some 2014 security right there. You need to do device trust. Location trust is a nice bridge to device trust, but when you do device uh, location trust, you are over trusting your corporate network and you are punishing managed devices off network. Those two things are bad. I don't wanna trust an unmanaged device just because it happens to be on my corporate network. 
you're bypassing all your security controls. And I want to trust my corporate managed hardened secure device off network. I basically treat everywhere as a public network, right? I don't care about perimeter security as much. I care about identity and access management and device security. That's the new way, that's zero trust. And that's what we do for our clients. So yeah, that, that was just kind of a, an overview. Next, I'm gonna launch into, um, I'm gonna launch into a demo. I just wanna poke around a little bit in Azure AD and kind of show you where we start to detect this stuff. And I wanna give you attendees of this, of this webinar, of this live event, a little bit of homework of, you know, hey, let me go back here and look at this myself, right? So I don't just wanna say, here's a bunch of fancy stuff that Jesse and his team did in the background. I'm actually gonna show you a little bit of how the sausage is made. Now, I must warn you, I'm about to show you a demo environment. This is not real data. I would love to show you one of my client environments. I obviously can't do that. This is just a demo environment. This is fake people and fake data, so don't worry. Second of all, there are signals in here and there are buttons and there are controls that are very easy to push a button and mess everything up. So please don't just go clicking, right? This is somewhere in the environment that if you just go clicking, it can be bad. Um, so don't do that, right? Um, I, I, I don't want you just to, to start to click around. A lot of our clients um, will start to, you know, they'll they'll get some information. They'll say, oh, oh, I, you know, I, I just, I saw, you know, where you're clicking and I started to click and I took everything down, right? And I'm like, what, why, what are you doing? Uh, so that's, that's my lesson to you, right? Is please go easy, don't go, don't go click happy. And just because it says something doesn't mean you know what it's gonna do. Um, so that's, that's just my, you know, uh, covering our bases here. So here I'm in my demo tenant. Um, this is, you know, as partners, we all get these. So the first thing I wanted to show you guys here and a great starting place to kind of start your journey is your secure score, secure score for identity. So I'm just in the Azure Active Directory Admin Center. I'm at the top level. As you can see here, this is just Azure AD, right? AAD.portal.azure.com. You can go there as, as a privileged account and you'll see this information. Your secure score for identity, I went over this in detail in the Modern Workplace Summit. Um, but this is an incredibly powerful tool to assess yourself, right? Again, this is a fake demo environment. Our, a lot of our client environments are a lot higher score than this. And if you're a small business customer and you have business premium licensing, this is actually a pretty good score. 63, 70, you know, 70, low 70s is actually about as good as you can get. Some of these scores um, are advanced licensing. You need E5 licensing, advanced identity licensing to get up near 100%, and you need to implement additional artificial intelligence tools on-prem and in the cloud in order to get near that 100%. So if you're a small business and you have, let's say above 65% secure score for identity, you're doing a good job, don't worry. If you have a 10, 15, 20, 30, even 40% score, you are vulnerable, you are weak, you need help, let us help you. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're at 11.48%, that's about as low as you can get. Microsoft just gives you some gimme points for syncing your identities. Um, you're in trouble, right? So here, I just want to show you secure score for identity. Here's a bunch of stuff that you can do. Um, I have these user risk policies turned on. I don't know why it's not scoring me. It maybe actually is scoring me. I just need to, um, filter how I'm looking at the score here. And again, I mess with this environment all the time. Yeah, so see, I'm, I'm, I'm doing these. I just have some exemptions. Uh, that's why it's giving me a lower score for user risk policy. So let's talk here about this, this case study and what I saw and what, what we did. So here in Azure AD, um, I went down to the security blade, right? So I wanted to show you guys here Depending on your licensing, this may or may not work. This may be different, but most of you should have this licensing and this should work for most of you. Under here, under report, I have risky users, risky sign-ins. This is critically important. So before I click on this, I again must warn you, you might go into your environment right now and click on this in your own environment. You might find that you are been breached already. So I just have to warn you that. We do this all the time. We do a demo for a client. I'm like, uh, did you know that uh, you know Bob and accounting is logging in from Russia right now? They're like, what? So 
you've been forewarned, you might find an active breach in your environment. I go to risky users. OK, I like to see this first. Well, first of all, this is me and then this is my test user, right? So what was risky about these? Now I have advanced licensing in this tenant, so I'm going to get more information about this, right? So I'm going to get more information than you guys may see in your environment. You may just get the risk uh, detect uh, risky user and that's it. So just a forewarning there, but I found those risky users for this case study here, risky users. Then I can go in and look at their risky sign-ins, right? And I can look at, and that immediately takes me to a report that says, hey, those users signed in from another country or they tried to, right? And that's how we figured this out, right? Or I can just go to risky sign-ins and depending on your licensing, you'll only have seven days to look back. But I like to look at these two things, risky users, and risky sign-ins, right? It's critically important that you do those things. Um, so yeah, that's that's really it, right? I don't wanna give you more than that. I don't wanna go off the deep end here because you could really get into it from here and that's what we do, but I just wanna start you there, right? Risky users, risky sign-ins. Now again, one end of the warning, you may find an active breach in your environment. That's scary. Lock them out, change the password, come do some baseline security with us. Two, you may find a false positive. These risk signals are not 100% guaranteed, right? Especially when you go to risky users and it says risk level low, even medium. It may just be an unfamiliar sign in or someone connected to a VPN sign in a second later, or they traveled on you, you know, oh, they just happen to go to Greece, right? So you, you may get some false positives here, don't worry. Just because someone shows up in risky users or sign ins does not mean you actually have a breach on your hands. So that's the other end of that, besides the fact that you might actually find a, a real breach. If someone in risky sign-ins here is signing in from Thailand or Russia or something and they're not on vacation there, you've been breached. Uh, sorry, sorry to say. So j just to put that out there for you guys. Um, but yeah, that's it in a nutshell. I wanna be conscientious of your time. I'll give it a minute or two if there's any questions, but, I just want to go through that the case study, the zero trust defense and depth strategy, where we found these risky users and sign-ins, and then what we did to block it. Some other time, I'll show you conditional access, right? That's a whole can of worms, uh, but it is the foundation of identity and access management security, and that's how this attack was stopped. Because again, these users did get their passwords breached. They did get their, they did, they didn't get them breached. They gave them out. That's <laughs> what always happens. There's no hacking anymore. It's people giving up their information. That's, that's how breaches happen 99 out of 100 times um, is where the weak link. And again, we're the front line of defense.